brothers and sisters, you are tuned in to the worship service of the Greater Little Zion Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Murphy, and we welcome you to this wonderful worship experience. Sit back now and enjoy our music ministry as they will come and share with you from the spoken word by way of song. And I'll come back and share with you in the preaching of God's word. Be blessed as the word of God blesses your spirit.
Good morning and welcome to the announcements for the week of October 3rd. First, the Greater Little Zion Church family sends happy 39th wedding anniversary wishes to Pastor James T. Murphy Jr. and First Lady Barbara Ann Murphy. They celebrated this special milestone on September 25th and the Zion family extends our well wishes and prayers for God's continued blessings in their lives. Pastor and First Lady Murphy, we celebrate your union and wish you forever love and happiness. On to the announcements. The Christian Education Ministry invites you to the Youth and Young Adult Sunday School held each Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Sister Tara McRae is the point of contact and the Zoom link is provided in each weekly email. The Christian Education Ministry also invites you to participate in the Adult Sunday School where each lesson is led by one of Zion's own dynamic teachers. Sister Lakita Jones is the point of contact and you're welcome to join in each Sunday at 8.30 a.m. and stay for our virtual worship service at 10 o'clock a.m. The Greater Little Zion Prayer Warriors meet each Wednesday at 6 p.m. where intercessory prayers and fervent praise and thanksgiving are offered for God's faithfulness. If you have a specific prayer request, Please contact your deacon or the admin office. Deacon Anthony Baysmore and Deacon Calvin Parsons Sr. are the points of contact. Adult Bible study is held each Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. and the discussions are facilitated by Pastor James Murphy and Deacon Joanne Johnson O'Neill. Thank you if you've already donated a $25 gift card to support the Evangelism and Missions Ministry in their endeavor to provide extra blessings to families in need during the upcoming holiday season. Please note that Visa gift cards are still being accepted through December 11th. You can either mail them to the church or deliver them to the admin office on Wednesdays of each week. Don't forget to mark your calendars and join the Family Ministries Couples Zoom session on Friday, October 15th at 7 p.m. The discussion on the topic of the submission cycle, Love and Respect, will be co-facilitated by Deacons Anthony and Terry Baysmore. The link to this study, along with discussion questions, will be provided upon request so please contact them for additional information. The Family Ministry's new prayer focus for the month of October is celebrating God's gift of life, and you are invited to join them in offering prayers for families to seek God's wisdom and to grow in the knowledge of His Word. Please remember, Women's Bible Study will be held this Saturday, October the 9th at 9.30 a.m. Sister Pat Edwards is the point of contact. Now for our highlights of community activities. The HBCU Virtual College Fair on October the 16th from 8.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. is hosted by the Prince Williams County Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. If you or someone you know is interested in attending this virtual session, please check your Zion email for the registration link or the QR code to reserve your place. Inspirational saxophonist and recording artist Tony Craddock Jr. is hosting the Cold Front Music Festival on Friday, October 22nd at 8 p.m. This event is 100% virtual and additional information can be found in your weekly emails. Brother Craddock Jr. is the husband of Sister Danielle and the son-in-law of Brother David and Dr. Rosalind Blunt. Please note that the first series of Town Hall Conversations sponsored by the Young People's Ministry of the Northern Virginia Baptist Association on stress and anxiety has been postponed. Watch your emails for any updates 
on rescheduling of this event. We routinely receive information on numerous community activities and church events, and more activities can be found on the church website at glzbc.org. Thank you, and have a blessed week. They said I wouldn't make it And they said I couldn't take it Oh, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm still standing Sometimes my friends walked away Oh Lord, so my family just wouldn't stay. Oh, I, Lord, I, I'm still standing. They said I wouldn't make it. Said I wouldn't make it. They said I couldn't take it. Said I couldn't take it. Oh, but I still stand it. Oh, sometimes the road gets rough, y'all. And the going gets tough sometimes, said Lord. I couldn't take it. experience. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of our pastor, Dr. James Murphy, in his absence. This morning, we want to share with you from the Word of God as found in the Gospel account of Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 6. Luke 19, 1 through 6. 
I'm going to read from the New International Version. Jesus entered Jer Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see Jesus, but because he was shot, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house. So he came down at once and welcomed Jesus gladly. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word that is about to go forth. We pray, Lord, that you will remove us from the way, that your word will go forth with power and strength as we teach today. In your son's Jesus' name, amen. For our topic today, we want to talk about grace for the despised. Grace for the despised. True grace goes much deeper than we think to think. We tend to reserve it for those who are already followers of Jesus Christ. However, Christ exercised grace, mercy, and love even to the most despised sinner. I am sure most of you are familiar with this biblical account of this tiny little guy by the name of Zacchaeus. Well, far from it being an entertaining, popular story among Sunday school attendees, the incident with Zacchaeus gives us an incredible example of God's grace and love. We see in the story not only a glimpse of the love Christ has for sinners, but also the result that came from such love. We see from the example of Zacchaeus, the fruit that can be produced in a life, and also the resistance that it can find among those who witnesses. This morning, to provide a context for this lesson, it must be mentioned that Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector. Because of this, the Jewish community would have hated him as it meant he collected taxes for Rome. Collecting taxes for Rome or for the Romans caused Zacchaeus to be viewed not as a traitor, but as a wicked sinner as well. And because he was a Jew, his employer, the Romans, would have also had a great disdain for him. Most likely, his co-workers would have despised him too because as the chief tax collector, he would have been ripping them off. He would have been skimming off the top of their ill-gotten gains. I imagine he may not... I imagine he may have gotten into this work because he felt a sense of power. Being a being just a tiny guy, I imagine he had a Napoleon complex, and, his, and this power probably gave him somewhat of a bolstering of his ego. So virtually what we have in this little man is nothing short of a despised thief. A kind of lone shark who used his authority to extort his own people in order to gain wealth for himself and for the government at odds with his people. His horrible reputation would have actually been accurate, which makes what Jesus did even more notable and shocking. Jesus singled out Zacchaeus, regardless of what regardless of the fact that he did absolutely nothing to deserve or attract his attention. All Zacchaeus was doing was trying to get a better look at a guy who was causing all the commotion in the community, Jesus. He simply climbed a tree to see what was happening. 
There was no prayers, no crying, no acts of repentance, not even any words. Just as is always the case, the initiative belonged to Jesus. It's interesting to take note of what Jesus didn't do. He didn't say, I want to stay at your house. Now, will you be a sport and have me over for some coffee? What he said was, I must stay at your house. The request, if you will, was more of a command than it was an actual request. I, I, I personally, personally don't feel a stretch to say that Zacchaeus must have been absolutely shocked by the fact that Jesus actually wanted to spend some time with him. But even so, how did Zacchaeus re react to the invitation from Jesus? What was Zacchaeus' response to the unmerited act of grace? He came down from, his, from the tree and he received Jesus. And he was very happy to do so. He didn't hesitate to respond to Jesus. In fact, the passage says he hurried down. Not only did he hurry to Jesus, he also did something remarkable which I am sure astonished those who knew him or knew about him. We read in Luke 19 and 8, Zacchaeus said, Zacchaeus said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I will give to the poor. And if, I, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will restore fourfold. In this particular case, we see the fruit of grace produced instantly. It was so immediate, it almost appeared as a knee-jerking reaction bordering on generosity. Most will identify today as a bad financial stewardship. Jesus came to Zacchaeus before he had a chance to display any kind of receptive attitude, not to mention remorse or desire. The, the charity displayed by Zacchaeus was not some kind of condition for grace. Rather, it was the result of grace. We don't see Jesus requiring anything from Zacchaeus. The passage does not give us any sort of sermon Jesus gave to inspire such an act. We don't see any suggestion from Jesus, no urging. We don't see Jesus attempting to guilt Zacchaeus in returning what he has stolen. All we see is a response that is more sacrificial than anything Jesus may have suggested. What Zacchaeus did surpasses mere obedience as nowhere in the Jewish law is there a demand for a person, for a person to give half of what they own to the poor. In like fashion, paying back someone you have defrauded four times the amount is going far above and beyond. Zacchaeus really proves himself here. Saying he did the right thing sounds too weak because he did that and more. And he did it immediately, joyfully, and generously. A grateful heart is a generous heart. A generous heart is a liberated heart. It is no coincidence that the very thing to which Zacchaeus was most enslaved, money, is the very thing that he was inspired to give away freely. Sadly, far too often Christians talk about grace using countless conditions or qualifiers. They add all kinds of ifs, ends, buts, clauses, and pauses. Just, 
just pay attention when the topic of grace is brought up before your eyes and your ears open, you will see and hear them. In fact, if people take the time to read this, depending on which forum they come across it in, look at the comments that will follow. If history is any indication, many much harsher comments adhering to the same line of reasoning. It seems their greatest concern is that people would take advantage of grace and use it as an excuse to live a life full of sin. They seem to think people would take advantage and use it as a ticket to live a life any way they see fit. I personally disagree. Where disobedience runs rampant, it is not the result of too much grace, but instead it is the result of failure to grasp how deep God's love is for us, even in the midst of our sin and selfishness. Grace and disobedience, or grace rather, and obedience are not enemies. They are not at odds with each other. Rather, in fact, they are allies. Just look at Zacchaeus' example. It's not just nowadays that we often see a negative reaction to grace. The very incident we are discussing recalls the reaction of the people who witnessed grace. We see in Luke 19 and 7 that when they saw it, they all grumbled. They had, he has gone to be a guest of a man who is a sinner. The crowd was all bent out of shape because Jesus chose to associate with one, with not only a sinner, but perhaps the most despised man in the whole region at the time. Their focus turned to Jesus but not in a positive way. This is what is commonly called guilt by association. And it runs rampant in our church today. It's a sad thing, very unfortunate. So much inaccurate judgmental assumption exists in the realm of guilt by association. At any rate, Jesus left no room for guessing when it came to what his mission was. Our example of Zacchaeus ends with these words from Jesus. Today salvation has come to your house, since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This is pretty clear proclamation. This is Jesus relating with the sinner and showing his love to those who deserve it the least. Surely before Jesus spoke the above words we just mentioned, Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eyes of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, Luke 18 and 25. Then what, do, what does Jesus go and do? He brings a rich person into the kingdom of God. Like it or not, God pours out his grace on the foolish, the weak, the despised, the nobodies, so that only he gets the glory that is due him. What would our impression of grace be if God only pursued those who were perfect? An endorsement like that would only reinforce our all too natural instinct for law prepared condition. But what he does, what he does do instead is go after those who have no question in their mind that they are in need of grace. This is an incredible news. For those of us that realize that our lives 
have been lived in such a way that there's more evidence of failure than success, that's the great news. That's the great news. For Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 to 29, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to things that are, so that no human being will ever boast in the presence of God. So in the case of Zacchaeus, we find Zacchaeus, a man who was despised by his peers and by his, his own people, looking for salvation from God. Zacchaeus, the Bible says Zacchaeus, because of his statue, heard about Jesus and wanted to get a glance of who Jesus was. So he climbed up into the tree just to get a glance of who Jesus was. Having no idea that this day salvation would have come to his house. Zacchaeus, a despised tax collector, undeserving of God's grace. Yet, God, in his infinite love, reached out to Zacchaeus. Despite of his reputation and what he has done, God's grace extends beyond to those who the society and the world thinks are not deserving of God's grace. And so this morning, I want to let you know that it doesn't matter what your condition in life is. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how bad you have been. It doesn't matter what you think of yourself. What matters is that God's unchangeable grace has been extended to you, no matter of your circumstances. All you have to do is to accept the grace of God, knowing that he loves you so much that he gave his life as a ransom for you. In the words of the songwriter, as I close, in the words of the songwriter, he said, I was sinking far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But a master of the, of the earth heard my despairing cry and from the waters lifted me. If it had not been for God's grace this morning, many of us would not have made it here to this worship experience. But thanks be to God who saw a faith who looks beyond all of our faults and he reached down to our knees. We can truly say that we've been blessed by the grace of God. I pray this morning that the God of all favor will extend his mighty grace to you despite of what your life circumstances are. He came to seek to save that which were lost. May God bless you this morning. May the Holy Spirit inspire you to understand that it doesn't matter what your circumstances of life is, that God's grace is sufficient and is on time for your life. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again for your word that has gone forth. We praise you, we glorify you, we exalt your name. We pray to God that those who feel unworthy of your grace, that you will reach down your hands and touch their lives that their lives will never be the same. From now on, we love you and we give you praise and glory, for it is in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. For those of you in, in the radio land, if you were blessed by this sermon, we encourage you to call the church at 703-239-911 and share your story with Pastor Murphy and the congregation. God bless you.